Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here once again. Let's do our last CVPP lecture for week four, spring 2020 quarter. It's Thursday. We left off talking about dissecting aneurysms. So let's talk about those, uh, aka aortic dissection, sometimes dissecting aneurysms, dissecting aortic aneurysms, all the same thing occurs when blood accumulates within the wall of an artery and then it rips longitudinally downward through the tunica media. It's a really kind of a strange thing. I've got some good pictures so I won't draw anything. Uh, because of the pressure as it rips in, it rips its way down longitudinally. may occur anywhere in the aorta. It loves the ascending where the pressure is higher Closer to the heart is more common. Where the pressure is higher, the more likely this is to occur. Uh, it is usually a type of false aneurysm. Remember we said that a false aneurysm means that there's a tear in the tunica intima and into the tunica media. And that's uh, blood can work its way into there. A true aneurysm means that there's no tear and there's just a weakness and the whole aneurysm kind of balloons outward. And here's a good picture of it. So here's the, and you got to know these parts, right? So ascending aortas from about here to here. Aortic arch is between these three takeoffs here. And the rest is the descending aorta. Uh, but here, for whatever reason, maybe they have Marfan syndrome, or maybe they had an old infection a long time ago. For whatever reason, they got a rip in the tunica intima, and the blood started forcing its way in there. And it couldn't, for whatever reason, it couldn't make it through the outer layer of the tunica media, and the adventitious too strong for it. But it found the middle, the substance of the tunica media is not that strong, and therefore it started ripping its way. Uh, I guess you can't see that very good, but it started ripping its way right down there. Sometimes it rips backwards. Those are called retrograde dissections. Those can be really dangerous. All right, so the hole, let's go back to this one. Uh, this thing, so we have a true lumen right here. That's just the lumen like any vessel, right? But now we have, we've made another thing that's called the false lumen, false lumen. And here's more of a cross-sectional view and you can see the false lumen and that's the true lumen. Okay. And we can see these on CT scan quite nicely. Uh, this would be the true lumen. This is not a very big one. This is a small dissecting aneurysm that started. It could all be troublesome and dangerous, though. And this is a false lumen. That's a new lumen. Uh, and you can see the kind of the wall between them there. Uh, those can get really, really big, as we'll see in a little while. Uh, the false lumen can get, start to grow bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where it starts to close off the true lumen, and that results in stenosis. I should probably, let me change my color real quick. How about let's do this color for a while. Yeah, so this false lumen can get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and pretty soon you got, it's a beaver dam, right? And it cuts off the flow of blood, just like a beaver dam. You get downstream ischemia from that. Um, but the false lumen has the ability to cause stenosis or luminal stenosis. So what would the clinical findings be if that's happening somewhere, in maybe the descending aorta, but still in the thoracic spine? Uh, well, it creates a beaver dam. So the pulses downstream, which would be the femoral pulse and the popliteal pulse, the, the posterior tibial pulse, dorsalis pedis pulse, they'll all be really, really weak. Uh, but the upper pulses might be actually too strong. So that's always one side. S strong upstream pulses, like upper extremities, and weak downstream pulses is a sign of something like that. And then it causes downstream ischemia as well. So the fingers and toes start might fall asleep, or they start... Maybe getting some skin changes down there, some some alteration formation. 
Is this going to cause any bronzing of the skin in the gator area? No. Remember, that's a problem where the, the beaver dam is in the veins and you get a backup and, and you get blood crenate. This is not a problem with too much blood in the lower extremities. It's a problem with not enough blood in the lower extremities. More clinical findings. So we just did Berger's test, right? I made a demo video on that. Berger's test would be positive because you're not getting good blood flow. The pipe is clogged. Uh, this time it's clogged because of not atherosclerosis, but it's clogged because of a um, a beaver dam because of a false lumen has grown and grown and starting to beaver dam the true lumen. You can run the brachial index test, uh, and that's going to be uh, positive. That'll be like less than 0.9. Right? We said anything below 0.9 was positive. And uh, maybe if the beaver dam is above the renal arteries, well, anything below the beaver dam downstream is going to have decreased blood pressure, decreased blood flow. So it could present with a R2 induced hypertension, R2A hypertension, uh, because of this beaver dam. So that's important as well. And remember, these are highly thrombogenic. Or don't remember, I don't think I told you yet, but the the blood inside of here, especially before it double barrels, can be really, really thrombogenic. And it can clot up. So and we'll talk about a double barrel here in a minute, but it's really dangerous. I'll show you some pictures so I won't draw that. Uh, but oh, where'd my picture go? I thought I put a picture in there. Uh, but double barrel, so the false lumen can rip its way all the way back in to the true lumen. And that actually happens more often than not. It's fairly common. Uh, and that phenomenon is called a double barrel aorta. Uh, and that's how a constant flow of blood, uh, or that now there's a constant flow of blood through the true lumen and the false lumen. And it's just kind of, kind of like a river, right? If you have, let's say you're going canoeing and you have a river like this, there's the main river stream and there's your canoe, you're canoeing. Uh, but maybe up here, there's a, another little pathway. But then it rips back in over here. The other canoe could go that way. And so that's kind of what a double barrel is. Uh, that means that you can have, we can put these together here. So we have blood flow going both ways. Uh, but it, this doesn't happen at first. It has to rip itself back in. Uh, so that would be the false lumen. And that's the true lumen. But, yeah, that's a double barrel. That's what double barrowing means. And just think of all that thrombus formation, because this thing clots like crazy. You'll have all this thrombus in there just waiting to break loose. And once the double barrel occurs, off it goes. And that can be really dangerous, especially if it's in your ascending aorta. I just jumped way above my slides. But, yeah, super high chance of emboli formation. Once the double barreling occur, here's a much better picture. Uh, bombs away. Uh, so here's a pretty high pressured false lumen. This is a dissecting aneurysm. And for a long time, it wasn't a through and through. It wasn't a, a double barrel aorta. But finally, for whatever reason, maybe he's doing squats or something increased the pressure and he popped it back in. All that thrombus, those blood clots, uh, that and I can call them blood clots now because I should call them thrombus formation here. But this is clotting. Remember th anything outside the the artery or inside the lumen of the or inside the wall of the artery you can call clots. But yeah, so that's uh, em that's emboli flowing downstream and those are bombs. Is th is this patient going to have a stroke? Who said who said yes? Come on. Can't have a stroke, right? Here's the flow. Who's the flow? Of, here's the flow of the river, right? To get a stroke, you got to go up through common, common carotid artery here, right? Brachiocephalic trunk, which branches into the common carotid, the right common carotid there, and subclavian there. Uh, but yeah, so these are not going to go upstream. If this dissection was happening uh, right here, 
then you could get a stroke, right? If one of these guys broke loose, it could go right up this, right up this tube right here and go up into the brain. So no, but it could get stuck in the renal artery, could get stuck in the, uh, where could it go? Any of the inferior superior mesenteric arteries and cause ischemia and infarct of the intestines. Celiac trunk who could go into the renal artery or the common hepatic artery. I mean, there's all sorts of possibilities for, the, for this when it occurs. There's just another cartoon of it. The inter official word of this is an intramural hematoma, which is inside the wall of the blood vessel. Um, yeah. Right. How does it start? Well, about 95% of the time, it starts with a rip in the tunica media. And then the high pressure rips its way through the tunica media. And uh, yeah, that's how it starts. And the pressure builds up and builds up. And then you get yourself, a, uh, as it starts to rip down, you get yourself a dissecting aneurysm. Where's the favorite place? Well, where's the pressure the highest? Probably the ascending aorta is the number one spot, but anywhere between the root of the aorta, which is the kind of the start where the ascending aorta connects to the heart is the root, uh, and then to the proximal one-third of the descending aorta, which is basically the thoracic aorta. So those are the most common places where it starts. And it doesn't have to, have to start with a rip in the tunica media. Sometimes it starts from a vasorum. Uh, remember that we have different types of arteries within arteries uh, to feed the, especially this outer layer. It's really hard. These are cells. They need to be fed as well. Um, so here's a vasora, but we had a aneurysm here form in the vasorum, and it ripped, and the blood started working its way down. Now, the, the pressure's not super high here, uh, so these may just cause a hematoma, but the trouble with these is they can they can get big. They can cause a beaver dam right here, uh, and that's the problem. Oops, that's the problem with that. Um, they could become a double barrel. Vertebral arteries have uh, do like to have this vasorum type of uh, arrangement with them. I think we will get time, probably have time to talk about that this quarter. Okay, uh, vasovasorum <clears throat> dissection typically results. As I said, the vasovasorum type dissection usually results in a wicked intramural hematoma. doesn't usually double barrel because of the pressure, uh, but it can cause stenosis, especially in the vertebral arteries, and you could start to get ischemia for something like that. Risk factors. So... Any condition that disrupts or, or causes the tunic immediate to be, or the whole, all of the tunics for that matter, any condition that makes them weak, uh, such as the hereditary connective tissue disorders, Marfan's, Louis Dietz, L. Stanler's, neurofibromatosis 1, blunt chest trauma where you're in a car crash and your chest hits the steering wheel, you get a concussion injury to the, uh, to the, they send an aorta somewhere, or any part of the aorta. Uh, and catheter procedures, any old puncture or scraping injury uh, from a catheter procedure, like an angioplasty of the coronary arteries. Uh, some other risk factors, smoking, uh, hypertension or strong risk factors, a previous infection, vasculitis of any of the uh, aortas is also a problem. What about the demographics? It likes older men uh, around 50 years of age uh, that are hypertensive. Uh, about 80% of all cases are associated with pre-existing hypertension. So that just puts a lot more stress on the pipes than most people have. And then for the younger crowd who gets them, they're usually the Marfans and Ellos Danler's crowd and neurofibromatosis one and that gang again.
Uh, ascending aortic dissections, worst possible place because it's next to the aortic valve. Uh, but about 65% of all of them occur in this region. Why? Because there's so much pressure there. Uh, there's a really big chance of stroke if a double barrel occurs because we're, we're now, if, if it occurs in the ascending aorta, we're upstream from the pipes that go up into the brain, brachiocephalic artery and the left common carotid artery both go up into the brain. Um, it can also go retrograde in this area and wreck the aortic valve and cause it not to be able to seal very good. And that's called, we've talked about that, I think. That's called aortic regurgitation. This is probably the best word for it, but aortic insufficiency, aortic valve insufficiency, other AKAs. Uh, cardiac tamponade can occur as well if you get a rip into the, if it goes all the way back to the aortic valve, you are now inside the pericardial cavity, and if it starts leaking blood, that blood can fill the pericardial cavity up, and it can squish the heart. That's called cardiac tamponade, and that's very, very dangerous. People die of that all the time. Here's the parts I should throw this in, the parts of the aorta right now. I, I did that, right? Aortic arch is in the middle where the takeoffs are. There's brachiocephalic trunk. We learned it as that. And another AKA is the anominate artery. A lot of cardiology books use the anominate artery. And you know the left carotid over there. And the descending aorta is right. starts right here. Okay, so it doesn't start down here where you would think. It starts right after this takeoff. What about other locations? Descending thoracic aorta, about 20% of the time. The aortic arch is under high pressure, but it doesn't happen there too much, about 10% of the time. Abdominal aorta, these are dissecting aneurysms, about 5% of the time. What if it ruptures? That's not, never a good thing if it ruptures, right? The aorta is under very high pressure, uh, and you'll, you'll bleed really, really quickly and go into hypovolemic shock because of that. We are going to talk about shock here pretty quickly. What, what's the best way of making the diagnosis? We've already looked at a couple pictures. It's a contrast CT scan is the gold standard. You can add some 3D reconstruction if you want. MRI study is the next best thing, then ultrasound. You can't see it on your in, on plain film radiographs. What do you make of this? Well, good. Somebody recognized this. That's the liver. What's that? Spleen. Somebody recognized that. Vertebral body. Aorta. Good. We got a dissection here uh, right there. Now, what is this? This is hard to see because this is just one slice. We can't see the tripod. Um, but that's the splenic artery. Right? So what's this right there? Celiac trunk, right? We study the celiac trunk. We can't see it, but there's a branch going to the liver, common hepatic. Uh, there's a gastric branch as well, left gastric. Headed that way. Uh, what about morbidity and mortality? It depends what type of the, what part of the aorta is involved. Uh, increased morbidity and mortality that uh, with dissections that occur above the ascending aorta or, or that occur not above in the ascending aorta or aortic arch those are called Stanford A we'll get to actually we'll get to those right now now you guys want to know what to study study this stuff because I guarantee you the stuff is it's on our boards it's on Canadian boards it's, everybody asks these questions uh, so you got to know how to classify these dissections. And there's a Stanford system, uh, which is pretty easy, but for sure make sure you know the DeBakey system, which is talked about in Robbins. Let's talk about them. So Stanford A means that the dissection must involve the ascending aorta. And that's the only rule. It has to involve the ascending aorta. It could go farther into the aortic arch, 
It might not. It doesn't matter. As long as it's involved, it, the dissection starts in the ascending aorta, then you got yourself a Stanford A. All right, so if it starts here, it's a Stanford A. It doesn't matter if it goes to here. Uh, it doesn't matter if it goes all the way down to here. It's still a Stanford A, but it has to be at least, uh, maybe it doesn't go anywhere. Look at this one. It's just only in the ascending arch. It's still a Stanford A. Stanford, uh, in other words, all dissections that are involved in the ascending aorta, everything I just said. This is the most common, which is not surprising because it's the under the highest pressure, part of the aorta that's under the highest pressure, and it's also the most dangerous. It includes DeBakey 1 and DeBakey 2. We'll talk about those quickly here. Let's make short work of type B dissections. Um, really quite easy. Um, so these involve everything, an aneurysm somewhere, anywhere except the ascending aorta. Okay, so here's, an, here's a dissection in the arch. Here's one that's just past the arch. So it doesn't matter. Here's the arch and the descending aorta doesn't matter but the rule is it cannot touch this area so that's pretty simple debakey is a little bit harder so debakey one means that the dissection starts in the aortic arch and this time it must progress if it doesn't progress if it starts if it's in the air the ascending aorta did I say arch? So it starts in the ascending aorta, and it has to progress. Um, it must. If it doesn't progress, it's DeBakey 2. That's the def definition of uh, DeBakey 2. It's only in the ascending aorta, period. End of sentence. It's only there. It's not in the arch. It's not in the descending aorta. Okay. Um, but the DeBakey 1 has to go at least into the aortic arch. It can go all the way down, but it has to progress at least into the aortic arch. Got it? Uh, these are, yeah, these are dangerous. You can see the overlap. Stanford A is DeBakey 1. They overlap, and it's DeBakey 2 as well. DeBakey 2 is only in the ascending aorta. Another one, urgent surgical repair. Debakey 3 involves only the descending aorta. So, yeah, so that's Debakey 3. There is no Debakey for, it doesn't, about 10% of the time you get a dissection in the aortic arch itself. There's no Debakey that covers that one. Right? There's no Debakey that covers that one by itself. Uh, DeBakey 3 only involves the descending aorta. It's like a Stanford B. All right, so DeBakey 1, it must progress, so it's the ascending aorta, and it's got to at least go into the arch or further. DeBakey 2 must be isolated to the ascending arch or the ascending aorta. DeBakey 3 can only be in the descending aorta, and there's no DeBakey for these, which is one of the reason cardiologists don't like in fact cardiologists don't really use this anymore it's more researchers who use that uh, they use a system called the Lanceman classification system which is much more uh, specific than what we just studied but that's way too deep for our purposes what about the epidemiology so the incidence has been calculated at about 0.3 percent of the population per year so prevalence is definitely higher based on cadaver studies. We think it's about 2% of the population is walking around with these things. Uh, so that's about 10,000 cases per year back in 2011. Females are affected a little bit more than males. That's not like a huge problem, though. The mortality rate for ascending dissections is not good uh, they're very dangerous mortality rate without treatment uh, there's some research on this for a stanford a or debakey one or two so that means it's got to be in the aortic arch or i keep saying that it's got to be in the ascending aorta you can tell i'm kind of tired today 
I was up late doing one of these last night. Um, damn internet. Um, so yeah, so here's the rates. So this is terrible. So about 1% will die per hour for the first 48 hours. 1% of people struck down with this without treatment will die. By the end of day two, 48% will be dead. By the end of day 14, 80% will be dead. So this is no joke. This is a really serious cardiovascular condition. What about for Stanford B mortality rate? This one's a lot better. The 30-day outcome, if you have a Stanford B, which means you have a dissection in your descending aorta, mortality rate at 30 days is less than 10%, sometimes 2, 3, at the most 10%. Uh, most of the treatment involves just kind of watching and waiting to see if they need to call in the surgeon or not. Now, that mortality rate goes way up if complications occur. Uh, it can be really dangerous if aortic stenosis is involved with this because uh, the blood flow is a little more turbulent, uh, usually with that condition. Uh, aortic rupture, if the aorta ruptures, then, of course, you're you're in big trouble actually talk about those if we get that far uh, and if it's a really long dissection those are all because it's got a higher chance of popping and bleeding retrograde I kind of mentioned retrograde dissections are really bad especially in the ascending aorta because it can rip back down into the aortic valve and knock out one of the cusps or both of the cusps and then it can actually leak and now we're inside the pericardial sac and we can get blood filling in, we can get the pericardial sac filled up with blood, and that causes cardiac tamponade, and that can be fatal. We'll talk about that when we get to the heart more. Here's a cartoon of regurgitation. So systole occurs, blood, uh, too much blood, right? The trouble with aortic regurgitation is this gets overfilled with blood. Right, because you just ejected all the blood out, but during diastole, some of the blood leaks back in. And during uh, aortic systole, it overfills the ventricle. Uh, so remember Frank Starling's law. Uh, it's going to contract more powerfully. And so you'll get a big blast of blood coming out. But the trouble is, when it rests during diastole, diastole is going to leak back. So your diastolic number can be low. And it makes a classic pulse appearance in one of these people, or, or in these people. Uh, but yeah, everything I said, so diastole blood retrogradely leaks back through valves that don't work very good. It overfills the left ventricle. Uh, so the heart in these people, it's just like a beaver dam. The left heart's like a beaver dam. So that causes blood to back up into the left atrium, into the pulmonary circulation, into the right heart. Uh, so it can back up and back up and back up. Um, but the important concept is that, that left ventricle is always overworked and always overfilled with blood. So Frank Starling's law is always in effect, and eventually it's going to lead to left ventricular hypertrophy. What happens with left ventricular hypertrophy if the muscle of the left heart gets too muscular? What happens to the blood vessels? They start to get pinched by the increased mass of the heart, and therefore you lose coronary artery blood flow through those pinched vessels and that that kills the heart even more so the heart gets weaker and it leads to left side heart failure pulmonary congestion and edema yep that's part of the beaver dam right i don't think we need to explain that anymore pulmonary hypertension damages the right heart then everything i just said Coronary artery stenosis, everything I just said, uh, uh, also occurs because the left ventricle gets too muscle-bound and it squeezes the, the coronary arteries. Remember the coronary arteries, like if this is myocardial tissue here, maybe it's part of the heart. Here's the lad running in this hole right here, left anterior descending artery, which is the widow maker if that gets... Uh, pinched and then we got a layer of connective tissue over the top of that usually the pericardium or the epicardium 
or serous pericardium. I, I guess you, I could say f for sure, I could say the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Anyway, what happens is the heart starts to get really muscular, right? It's all beefed up, and it starts to pinch the little trough, and the poor little coronary artery gets squished in there, and that causes poor ischemia of the heart, right? What are the symptoms of aortic regurgitation? Um, well, you're going to have a exertional dyspnea because your heart doesn't work good. You go up a hill or go upstairs, and your body's demanding for oxygen, more oxygen. The muscles want oxygen and want more blood now. Your heart can't handle it. It just can't pump that high. Uh, so you get uh, kind of an exertional dyspnea. And uh, you start waking up in the night with... Uh, nocturnal problem with nocturnal dyspnea you just have trouble breathing right you're you pay you're like you're out of breath uh, orthopnea is really common as it gets worse you can't sleep flat anymore uh, the pulmonary congestion which is starting can get into the alveoli much more easily in some of the smaller bronchi if you're seated or sitting upright then you got gravity kind of keeping that edema um, down in the parenchyma of the lung. Um, but as that gets worse, that doesn't work. And then you start spitting up a little blood, pink frothy sputum, uh, is classic of pulmonary edema. Then you get something called a water hammer pulse. I forgot to put that in. I've always been meaning to put that in. It is in, not in Bates, but Seidel actually talks about it. Uh, so we need, that. that's pretty high yield, right? I'd probably like to get that on a test. Um, but there's some common AKAs, this Corgan pulse uh, or a collapsing pulse. So let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, it's seen only in aortic regurgitation. And the problem is because of Frank Starling's law. We said when the left ventricle gets overfilled with blood like it is all the time in aortic regurgitation, you get a huge blast of blood out of there, and you can feel a pulse. They say the pulse feels like, you ever feel it when you're doing the cutoff pressure for the uh, brachial artery? Uh, you can feel the pulse squirting, kind of a squirting pulse, or when you do that technique where you push down and let the blood back up and slowly release the pressure, and you feel a couple of big pulses, big blasts of blood. That's what a water hammer pulse feels like. Um, but it's so, it's ridiculously short. It's like a quick poking uh, of your fingers because diastole falls off really fast because the blood backwashes into the left ventricle. Uh, so there, you can measure it, and you can see it on uh, by these measuring devices, but we don't do that. So um, one way to tell if you think it's a really strong, unusual pulse is lift your head up. Uh, lift your arm above the head and take the pulse again. Uh, it will exaggerate the ha this hammering pulse, uh, and that's called uh, a water hammer, hence the hammer. 55-year-old smoker has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, initially presented to, for low back pain with radiating leg pain. You took your, your standard chiropractic x-rays, are you ready to treat this patient is the question. You ready to do grade 5 manipulation on them? Better say no. In fact, you better refer this guy to the hospital. You guys see it? It takes a while to get your eyes. And you can thank Monkberg's medial sclerosis. Uh, because remember, Monkberg's puts a little calcium in the tunica media. And there's a calcium right there. But look at this. I'll draw it in here. There's the size of the order, and all of a sudden it goes whoom. Then we hit a gas bubble there. It kind of makes it hard to see. That's a huge abdominal air aneurysm, right? This guy ended up having immediate surgery. There you can see it. I won't draw it to mess it up. You can certainly see the lines of the aorta there. Normal size, and it gets really big. Oh, I did highlight it, demonstrated my amazing Photoshop skills. Uh, we could do a CT myelogram. This isn't the same patient, but you get the idea. Uh, there's the true lumen filled with contrast. And you can see the true lumen's getting a little squished here, isn't it? Not too bad. Uh, but what do you see here? What's this? 
yeah, that's the false, that's the false lumen. So this is a big dissection. Two we remember this patient had radiculopathy. Anybody see a reason why he might have pain radiating a radicular pain and he had positive neurological findings, so he had radiculopathy. Anybody see why this might be so? Good, somebody saw it. Look at the big bone spur right there. Right? It's got the nerve root chased way up to the top there. Got some irritation of that nerve root probably. Uh, what's the clinical presentation of a type A dissection that's happening? Typically, they come into the ER and they feel like a ripping pain in their chest. And then uh, the pain, sometimes, about half of the time, it radiates to the scapula, in between the scapula, so they have mid-back pain. Maybe they'll come into your office. But here's the difference. The, while they're in the ER, the pain, the patient says, you know what, the pain's moving. Now I feel it down by my left breast. And the pain, as the or as the dissection rips further and further, the pain changes in location. Uh, so that's a classical DeBakey 1, DeBakey 2, Stanford type A. That's how that usually presents. Uh, and the, they may be faked out. I mean, they might be think they have a myocardial infarction. It's difficult to tell the part. you got to get your troponins levels tested because classic myocardial infarction is like a crushing chest pain like an elephant sitting on my chest and hypertension is quite high and with tachycardia there's a beaver dam somewhere and you're trying to push through that so heart is pushing fast and hypotension is a really bad sign that means the patient's probably leaking somewhere and you better find out where quickly Here's a 65-year-old that comes into your office with some mild non-localized chest pain and dyspnea. Oscillatory exam is okay. There's no murmurs, but he does have tachycardia. You check his arterial pulses. Uh, the arterial pulses in all lower extremities is minus one. You can barely even feel the popliteal. You go to the upper extremity pulses in the, uh, the radial, the ulnar, and brachial brachial, they're all really pounding, almost almost the uh, water hammer type pulse. So you order a CT scan. What's the problem? There's the hint. I gave it away, didn't I? Yeah, well, this is a bad one, isn't it? So that's the aorta, and this is the false lumen right here, right? Contrast. No, there's no contrast there. Uh, but the true lumen is cut down to about half of the size so that's a problem All right, everything I just said alright so let's see let's do abdominal aortic aneurysms talk about them how many slides have we done like let's ever keep going a while um, just, I guess I could have put this earlier, but just to remember how the pipes go, this is the thoracic aorta. It's called the descending as well. Thoracic aorta. Once you go through the diaphragm, the uh, aortic coiatus, the diaphragm, then you're the abdominal aorta until you split to the right and left, common iliacs. They split again into the internal and then the external iliac arteries. And then once you cross the line here, inguinal ligament, it turns into the common femoral artery here. So that's kind of the pipes. There's the important renal arteries, which need to be well perfused to prevent any type of hypertension from occurring. Oops. There's a nice cadaver. You see, how's that cadaver aorta look? Well, there's an arrow pointing to it. That can't be good. Yeah, that's a nice little... Uh, almost a saccular. I think I'd have to call that a large saccular, more than a fusiform. But see how it's affecting the the inferior mesenteric artery here. So it could be could be clogging this up with some gunk. Uh, could have problems. So uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. They are seen in smoker males again. A little older this time, greater than 65. Incidence has been on the rise. 
and probably because the baby boomers are getting uh, older. There's a client I had last year. I had to send them to the uh, send them to cardiologist to get checked. Uh, radiologist completely missed this, by the way. So there's the ascending aorta, but you can clearly see it's too big, right? It's 0.26 millimeters. It's not gigantic, but uh, the aorta should be around 15 millimeters or so, right? Or 1.5 centimeters, and it was way big. And, yeah. Uh, so here's a follow-up management. So once they get, once they get uh, over 2.5, you got to keep an eye on them. So you don't need to do anything for about five years. Uh, but as they get bigger, once they get over f between 4 and 4.5, you got to... Repeat your imaging studies uh, just to make sure it hasn't grown. And once they get over five, I mean, it's 5.5, you have to have them fixed. They can get really big, though. What is the best way to fix these? Kind of going out of order. Um, but you can put stents in there. Uh, so you can do that through a catheter through the femoral artery. Uh, and you stick a stent in there. You stick a little probe in there, and it has a has like a sling, you know, it's almost like a slinky, think of a slinky, uh, but it's compressed into a little tiny, uh, tiny skinny slinky about the size of a pencil. And you put that in the diseased aorta and you let it loose and it springs open. And that's basically stent formation. Here's kind of a cartoon of how it's done. Catheters going in. Uh, this had a big dissecting aneurysm here. Or I guess this is just a fusiform filled with lots of plaque. But they put a stent up here and then just let it loose and it popped open like a slinky. And um, yeah, you can put one up the other side as well. And yeah, you basically build a new artery from the inside out. So you don't have to do any abdominal surgery on these patients, which is nice. Okay, uh, typically occur where do these occur for whatever weird reason they occur just a little bit downstream uh, to the renal left renal vein uh, even the renal arteries you could say uh, but the renal vein actually crosses over remember your anatomy it crosses over the anterior portion of the renal artery and it's possible there could be a little swirl of blood there and it because uh, that's where these aneurysms usually start that's where pad usually starts as well so just a little downstream. Here's the anatomy of the region, the abdominal aorta. There is the right, did I say left? Uh, oh, that's the right renal artery right there. Uh, this is the left renal vein right here. And see how it pushes right uh, about where those, I guess the arteries are coming out even on this one. All right, anyway, that's a high-risk area right there. Most of these abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, they're fusiform in design. Could be saccular about 5% of the time. Could be up to 15 centimeters in diameter. They can get ridiculously huge. Just we'll see, we'll see one in a little bit. Uh, they could be really long. Uh, but anything over about 5 centimeters... 5.5 centimeters is emergency situation. Anything better, when you start getting around 15 centimeters, they're uh, really, really dangerous. It's the 15th leading cause of death in the United States. Advances in surgical management have decreased the death rate quite a bit. We're getting good at fixing these things. Uh, and prompt, you don't want to monkey with these things. Uh, surgical management is the key to staying alive. Very easy to miss these on radiographs. They did a study on this, and the uh, of radiologists, 42% on some studies miss these things. So you get, I mean, radiologists these days, they don't have much time to look at images, so they're easy to miss. How about this one? I hope none of you miss that one. You can't miss that guy, right? There it is right there. Right? Thank goodness for Monkbergs. Put a little calcium there. Um, so yeah, so radiologists had a bad, bad decade right there. That study where they missed about forty percent of spine gen, common spine generating path or pain, spine uh, pain generating pathology. 
Yeah, they go too fast. They need to slow down. Um, so rupture, this is not good. Uh, the bigger they are, the greater the chance is to rupture. Um, they do grow asymptomatically, completely asymptomatically. About a half a centimeter a year is the normal growth of these things. Uh, typically ruptures, surprisingly not forward, but if the abdominal aorta we're talking about still, uh, if it ruptures, it usually ruptures posteriorly into the retroperitoneal space. Uh, and the hemorrhage event is the first symptoms the patient may have, usually abdominal pain. It's the most common symptom of this stuff. So here's the peritoneum, or peritoneal cavities right here. Here's the retroperitoneal space back here. Okay, and it, there's the rupture. And it's leaking back into the retroperitoneal space. So something really interesting can occur here. Uh, you can get a compartment syndrome. This can fill up with blood uh, to the point the pressure starts to raise in the retroperitoneal space here. It raises so high it might be higher than the aortic pressure. And you could stop the flow of blood. Patient may actually be, feel better. Stomach pain stops. Uh, it's a temporary window because it's going to rip into here real soon as the pressure keeps increasing. It can't hold it forever. So that's an interesting phenomenon. Only about 20% rupture anteriorly. If you rupture anteriorly, you're probably not going to make it to the ER. You probably die. So luckily most of them rupture toward the backside, 80% in the retroperitoneal space. Um, but yeah, you're going to start bleeding really bad, right? Tremendous amount of pressure. Blood will just come flying out of that. Uh, and you'll pass out, go into hypovolemic shock, and uh, can die with that. We should talk a little bit about shock, uh, too, as well. Um, shock means that the body's tissue is running out of oxygen. You are hypoperfused, including the brain. And it's super dangerous because you can permanently damage your kidneys, um, your spleen, your heart. Your spleen's not that important. Uh, but your lungs, your brain. I mean, you've got to have oxygen. You wreck those tissues, they can't come back. Uh, there's five different types of shock. That's a nice, easy question, uh, right? We're not going to cover all of them, but cardiogenic. Well, take a guess what the cause of the problem is there. The pump is broken. Hypovolemic shock. Well, the blood volume, for, for whatever reason, uh, is not working. Usually a leak. It's usually this is what aortic aneurysms uh, cause hypovolemic shock because you're leaking blood out of the system. Uh, septic shock. What's that one? Well, that that's, means that you have bugs, usually bacteria, staph, or whatever, you have so many bugs inside your, floating around your blood that it makes it thick and cloggy uh, and increases the viscosity of the blood. And therefore, you can't deliver oxygen to the tissue because all that gunk is in your blood. What about anaphylactic shock? Well, you're allergic to something and histamine is released all over your body and all the capillaries, remember we said all the capillaries can't be open at one time. And, and severe anaphylaxis, that's exactly what happens. And you can uh, lose all, you can lose your blood volume that way if you dump all your blood into your skin. Um, and neurogenic shock, we won't talk about that one. Actually, we're just going to talk about a couple. Cardiogenic shock is caused by a failing heart uh, for many different reasons. But the pump, the bottom line, your ejection fraction, the blood coming out of the heart, uh, it just isn't enough. You have decreased blood flow, decreased perfusion, and death uh, in that order. Usually occurs secondary to a massive myocardial infarction that knocks out your left ventricle, and you can't pump blood anymore, and you're going to go hypovol not hypovolemia, but if you can't pump blood out there, uh, the blood flow is, you will have hypo, go into hypovolemic shock from that even though it's from uh, the cardiogenic shock from something in the wrong with the heart. Okay, other reasons for heart failure. Cardiomyopathy is a really broad term. There's many causes of cardiomyopathy. Maybe it was a, an infection, rheumatic fever, 
um, idiopathic maybe. Uh, the most common cause is from hype, chronic hypertension. People have have their arteries all clogged up and it's really hard to push blood through the arteries to keep the tissue happy. The heart will try to do that to keep the tissue happy, uh, and but at, at a cost. It makes the heart really muscular at first, but the heart wears out. It can't it's like lifting weights. You can't lift heavy weights all the time. You have to have a break or you have to go to light weights for a while. You can't do it all the time and it wrecks the heart. Um, so chronic hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, it cr also crushes the coronary arteries, right? And it causes ischemia of the heart, which makes the output even worse. So another mechanism of that there. Uh, severe arrhythmias, people with innocent PVCs, they're usually in, innocent, premature ventricular contractions, uh, as long as the burden of them doesn't get too high. Some people have burdens, 40, 50% of their heartbeats are erratic. And PVCs, when you have one PVC, you don't pump blood very well out of your ventricle. So um, you can get a decrease of blood coming out of your heart from arrhythmias, and PVCs is just one example. Uh, chamber obstruction, yeah, that makes sense. If you have a beaver dam blocking the flow of blood out of the left ventricle, or like aortic stenosis, or cardiac tamponade, or maybe a big a saddle embolism that's just not letting blood flow into the lungs. If blood doesn't flow into the lungs, it doesn't flow into the left heart, and it can't flow out of the left heart. Uh, it could be an infection. It could be severe aortic stenosis. Yeah, so those can all cause uh, we, cardiogenic shock. Hypovolemic shock is what we're talking about. Uh, it occurs when the circulating blood volume becomes too low to perfuse the, the body's tissue. It's a low blood. Uh, we talked about it a little bit. Anything that cause, can be caused by anything that decreases blood volume, like dehydration. Maybe you got some, you went to the Amazon jungle and got some weird virus and your cells are all infected and can't can't reabsorb water from the fecal material and you got terrible diarrhea. And the blood is mostly water, so you'll start to get hypovolemia because of the dehydration of that. Uh, Addison's disease, right? We need aldosterone. Uh, without aldosterone, you can't reabsorb water from the blood. So it's another way. Or diabetes insipidus is ADH. You need ADH to withdraw free water from the nephron. Uh, so that's another one. Anaphylaxis can cause this as well. You could call that anaphylactic shock though as well. Maybe not the greatest. That probably should be in, under anaphylaxis. But kidney disease certainly. Uh, if you have uh, hepatitis or, which leads to cirrhosis of the liver and your kidneys can't make albumin anymore. Well, you're going to lose fluid out of your blood. You can't return the fluid like we talked about. Uh, therefore, you have hypovolemia from that. Or maybe you have kidney disease and it can't, proximal convoluted tubule can't return sodium like it's supposed to. Water follows sodium and you lose you lose water volume that way. See all that stuff, How the, a lot of that stuff we've went over is kind of coming back now. Uh, or you can have a flat out leak. You're like we've been, that's kind of where we came from. Uh, so uh, you could also call that hemorrhagic shock if you're leaking blood as a form of hypovolemic shock. Three basic types of hemorrhagic shock. You have, there could be internal hemorrhage from what we're talking about right now, an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Could be external hemorrhage from a your car crash and you cut your wrist, you're bleeding like that could be a fractured femur, a lot of blood vessels in the femur and near the femur. Remember the circumflex, the lateral and medial circumflex femoral arteries uh, could be bleeding like crazy. What about other causes? We kind of talked about albumin and kidney disease. We talked about that. Diarrhea, this kind of a review slide, diarrhea. Uh, diuresis, the kidney lets out too much water. Hyperaldosterone. We said we need aldosterone. Addison's disease will cause hyperaldosteronism, right? The whole adrenal cortex isn't working. Diabetes insipidus, talked about all those. 
What about clinically? How does the patient present? Well, they present with low blood pressure, uh, cold and clammy skin, right? If they have, if you don't have a lot of blood, why the body shuts off the the skin? The sympathetics, epinephrine, they can flow and shut off the skin, uh, and to try to conserve, so your skin will be cold and clammy. And what else? Rapid thready pulse. Your heart's going to pump harder and faster to try to make up the difference. You have tachycardia, tachypnea. Uh, you might get confusion, some confusion going on. Uh, so meta-analysis, so signs of a ruptured aortic, abdominal aortic aneurysm. There's a kind of famous meta-analysis, strongest evidence there is, right? A meta- meta-analysis, a well-done meta-analysis. Pooled the data of over 700 symptoms of people who had confirmed ruptured aortic aneurysms who lived, some live, some didn't live. But here's the most common symptoms. Abdominal pain is the number one finding. Most of them also went into shock uh, because of hypervolemia. Uh, they had tachycardia associated with that shock. Uh, surprisingly, the third most common finding, they could fa- feel a p- massive pulsatile abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, to palpation. Uh, they also have back pain and then some syncope as well. All right, there's the official results. But by far, abdominal pain has stood out uh, from the others. Shock, pulsatile mass, and bank, back pain were uh, pretty pretty close together. Syncope was back their ways. Okay, uh, retro. So I kind of talked about this, but a retro uh, peritoneal abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture, there's this kind of a compartment syndrome that takes place. So after a posterior rupture, blood will quickly fill the retroperitoneal space up, as I said. Uh, And once the pressure is equal to the pressure in the aorta, it may stop leaking and the pain may go away and it may lure patients into a kind of a false sense of security. And the uh, but it's only temporary. That eventually it's going to rip into the peritoneal cavity, out of the retroperitoneal cavity into the peritoneal cavity, uh, and the patient's going to die. Uh, so if that does happen, that, that kind of eye of the hurricane, so to speak, that can buy patients time to get to the ER quickly and be checked out. Then they have another hurdle to overcome. In the ER, they're probably going to have hypotension and tachycardia. And they, you better make sure that they don't have an abdominal aortic, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, a bleeding aneurysm, before you give them fluids, because it happens all the time. Fatal mistake if if the, if the hospital staff gives the patient fluids and raises the pressure, there goes the the uh, the compartment syndrome. Uh, it pops into the peritoneal cavity and they die. Uh, so you have to be really careful with that and ch- look at the other signs. And eventually the retroperitoneal cavity will rip into the peritoneal cavity uh, and then you're going to die. Circuitory collapse, hypovolemic shock. Uh, how about some risk factors for the development of a arterial uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm? Atherosclerosis almost always pre- is pre-existing. Uh, here's a patient who died and they butterflied open his abdominal aorta. There's this common iliacs there. You can see massive blood clotting in here. You can see tons of atherosclerotic gunk in there as well. So it's it's it predated uh, the aneurysm. The inflammation, remember, atherosclerosis is an inflammatory process and that destroys the uh, the tunics. What's the sequelae of thrombus? Uh, well, atherosclerosis within the AAA, that's a perfect breeding ground for thrombus. So you can get emboli. Where are those emboli going to go? Where are they going to go downstream? Are they going to go to the brain? No, what's downstream from the abdominal aorta? Well, the iliacs, they may go into the internal iliacs. They may go down into the leg somewhere. They're probably not going to kill you. That's the least of your worries. Uh, what about hypertension? So the bulging, especially some of them get really big, they might compress the renal artery and cause a beaver dam in it. And what will that do? 
If you compress the renal artery, you're going to get secondary hypertension. How come? Because the R2A is going to get turned on, right? Macula densa cells are going to sense that, and they're not going to be happy, and they're going to release renin, and you know the rest of the story. Seen in about 50% of large abdominal aortic aneurysms. Uh, so, yeah, this R2A induced hypertension is actually very common. Maybe that's one of the first signs they present with. How about some other squillae? Uh, if the aneurysm is just right, it can compress the ureters if it's big enough. Uh, and it can plug those up and it can back up urine into the kidney and you can damage your kidney from increased pressure in the renal pelvis. Uh, so that's another thing that can happen. It could compress the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries. Remember, we looked at one uh, that was downstream, or we looked at one that was engulfing the inferior mesenteric artery. Uh, so it could cause stenosis of that, and you could get downstream ischemia, and you might get a small bowel infarct, incredibly painful. Uh, the bowel could rupture, and you could get peritonitis, and you could get septicemia uh, from that. You could go into septic shock from that one. Uh, what's the sequelae of an abdominal aortic aneurysm? Uh, how about a vertebral erosion? This is probably the least of our worries, but it is a pulsatile thing. Here's this gigantic aneurysm, right? A little tiny dissection. There's the, the true lumen. It's been pushed all over there. Uh, but look at how big this thing is. And it's taken a chunk out of this vertebrae because of the pulsatile nature of this. There's a nice 3D reconstruction of a giant aortic aneurysm. Uh, some fun facts about these things. 50% of people will die during the first 24 hours after a ruptured or leaking abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, nowadays, surgery is much safer than back in the days of old, so it's fairly effective as long as you go to a big hospital that does a lot of those.